Welcome to our talk. Uh, we will talk about today uh, cross-platforms cross and uh, specifically about Kotlin multi-platform and um, actually how you would make use of uh, Kotlin to like also change your ar architecture a little bit. Like, we will talk about architecture as well uh, and how Kotlin is different than, than the others basically. Yeah, exactly. Um, so my name is Toby. This is Tassin. I work at Novoda in Berlin, which is an agency slash consultancy, and Tassin at Wayfair. And yeah, we had the chance while we were working together at Novoda to spike in Kotlin multi-platform, and we want to share our learnings with everyone here. And yeah, so now you know us. Now we want to know you a bit better. So we are really curious um, who's writing Kotlin code in general first. Which is like uh, almost everybody. An, an obvious <laughs> question on the Android conference. But who, who's also writing Kotlin code for non-Android use cases, like for the back end? Yeah. Okay. Quite a lot of people. Do we even yeah. have some iOS developers here? I know that sounds really weird, but oh. yeah, awesome. Cool. Great. But, Great. but like iOS people like written, writing Kotlin in iOS? Not no. yet. Not okay. yet. Okay, cool. Okay. Yeah, so we will talk about that too, yeah. and uh, we will. We don't have like too too many code, but we have a little bit code, and uh, it may seem familiar with Swift, but it is actually Kotlin. Uh, yeah, just yeah. So we want to start this talk with a really bold statement. Um, so the technology we talk about, Kotlin multi-platform, Kotlin native, this will be a real game changer for the collaboration between Android and iOS people, at least, at least we think so. So stay tuned. So let's talk about why do we even share code, right? Uh, so the first thing comes to mind is, is the cost, basically. You know, when you think about not even sharing code multi cross-platform, but like, you know, uh, everybody uses lots of, lots of library. You must have heard about like the term called like do not invent the wheel, right? Uh, that's basically actually sharing code. Uh, we do libraries, frameworks to, to you know, share, share the knowledge uh, as much as possible. Then that is because of the cost, because, uh, yeah, you do essentially write less code, uh, and then means less, less cost. Yeah, but it's not about the cost at least not just about them. It's also about the quality. Um, I mean, we all know the batches on our famous GitHub libraries where they say X percent test coverage. So as soon as we start to share our code with others, we really make sure this is good code, right? And yeah, in the community or for one platform, we see also there is a lot of code sharing, right? I mean, just imagine all the frameworks, all the libraries we use, what would we do without the community that, um, that comes up with them. But, um, so this is for the platforms, but what if we leave this layer? What if we look at our organization and the different layers we have there, where we have the mobile team, the web front and the back end team? Unfortunately, there's not too much code sharing there. And um, why is that? The reason is obvious. It's because of the different technology stacks we have. The back end team is working on Go, the JavaScript, or the front-end team is working with JavaScript with the latest frameworks there. And the iOS people are working with Swift, Objective-C, we are working with Kotlin and Java. And there have been a couple of um, yeah, attempts to introduce some sharing, like what we heard this morning, using a JavaScript runtime or using J2 Objective-C, but it's hard, obviously, and therefore, there have been a couple of um, yeah, frameworks lately yeah. or also recent, yeah. Yeah, like everybody like trying to solve this uh, problem, obviously, like there has been like, you know, when you look at PhoneGap, et cetera, it's like really uh, old projects and like recently uh, the more solid project that I, I, I can say is like React Native and Flutter is re uh, getting uh, really famous and then Cut the multi-platform is just experimental is like uh, a, a newborn basically is in the field. Yeah, so like we will not compare them uh, a lot, but we feel like Kotlin is taking uh, like different approach, basically similar to what Jake Burton uh, 
had in, in this morning, so he explained it very well, I think. Uh, but we will not uh, go further in, in, into um, comparison, but see what Kotlin offers uh, in this area, basically. Yeah, but it's still important to understand what's the difference, actually. So these tools, except of Kotlin in the middle, they come basically from the platform. So what they do is they try to abstract the platform for you away, and they give you one API, and you can use it, and you come with your business logic and um, you use this. And this, you, this works for use cases, right? For games, for, I don't know, use cases where the, um, the platform is not that prominent, where you have a huge or a big brand. Um, that makes sense. But otherwise, I mean, the marketing message, write code once with one of these tools, um, this, is, this won't work in reality. And, the ones that have been using these tools that know that already. And in the end, what does it mean? We need platform, or we need these framework experts, we need the people that are able to work on React Native, but we still need um, the platform experts to add the tracking ads and all these kind of things. So yeah, the question is what do we actually um, win here? Yeah, so the next thing is, you know, already talk about sharing code, but why is it so difficult? So like there's no silver bullet in this area yet, so everybody is comparing the, the platforms, like mo mostly you have, uh, yeah, different uh, platforms, frameworks working for different uh, use cases uh, for better. So we will go into like more details why, why this is actually difficult now. Yeah, because Kotlin multi-platform comes from the other side. It basically gives you the utilities to just share your business logic and deal with the platform. So sharing logic um, is actually hard and um, sounds easy. And why is not everyone already doing this? Um, one of the reasons, especially on mobile, is that uh, mobile projects have been traditionally started as side projects to enterprise web or desktop systems where we ha can look back to decades of experience and where we have software architects that um, yeah, work for the project and they basically have lots of experience and can look back to that and can use that. And for mobile, we basically, we struggle a bit on that side. We recently um, got support from the framework or from the SDK where the, with the architecture components and since a couple of years there's also lots of initiatives to introduce all these patterns that are already known, MVC, MVP, MV something on mobile. Um, yeah, but it's still hard. Yeah, so we will uh, talk about the story a little bit. These two uh, are superheroes in, in, in your company. Uh, so one iOS and Android uh, developers. Uh, so they are working really hard to, uh, to build features, right? And then uh, they are working together, but also two separate teams. But suddenly they, maybe it's one of uh, you in the audience, you hear about the Kotlin multi-platform, like really excited and go back to your desks and try to use it basically, like tomorrow maybe, or, or Thursday after the conference. Yeah, and then, well, you look at your IDE, at your, I don't know, Android Studio, Xcode, you have your home view controller, your base activity open, and you can scroll all the way down, 3,000 lines of code. I mean, we have been all working with these kind of classes, and if, especially if you stick to our legacy code base, you will still have to deal with such classes, right? Um, yeah, so if you are such person or if you work with such code base, then we have one good news at least. As Tessin already mentioned, Kotlin multi-platform is still experimental, so you still have some time to clean your um, code base up. And no worries, this is not gonna turn into an architecture talk. But um, on the other hand, we think it's really important because um, if you are not able to separate your business rules from your platform, then you won't be able to use this tool at all. And this would be really sad. Yeah, so 
as we said, like now we will go into a little bit architecture, but just a little bit. So uh, two, two bullet points that we will uh, talk about basically um, about architecture that we can make use like just two principles that we can, uh, we can <laughs> apply to, to make it easier, make our lives easier. So this is uh, uh, Uncle, Uncle Bob. Is, uh, yeah, he's really famous in, in software development. Uh, he, he has like several books on clean codes. Uh, some of you may uh, like him or, or not, I don't know. But uh, the two codes uh, uh, we will talk about today is like we think really important. Yeah. So we are not here to advocate any MV something um, pattern. This, I mean, there have been other talks to introduce MVI or something. So this is really about the core fundamentals, what, what is important here. And um, one quote is, the delivery mechanism is an annoying detail from him. And what does he mean by that? It basically means if you deliver your application to Android, if you deliver your application to the web, if you deliver your application as mobile application or as another application, your application or your code shouldn't talk about that. That shouldn't be too prominent. This should be on detail. What does it mean? It means you should have clear boundaries between your business rules and your platform. And also maybe try to actually deliver your platform or deliver your application to a different platform. So one example that um, we have been doing for a specific project is that we um, took our business logic, our use cases in the clean architecture, and we just replaced the whole um, view layer on Android and we replaced it with their interactive command line interface, like a groovy shell. Yeah. And, and it was awesome. I mean, we could quickly test, you know, some of the quirks of our business logic, and it worked really well. And um, in the end, that helped. And it also helped us to foresee, actually, how we should um, develop our application. Yeah, the other one is the screaming architecture. And uh, so this is, I think, traditionally a problem in Android. Like, even when you uh, look at the sample projects provided by Google and traditionally when you go uh, file new uh, in Android Studio and create a new project, even the uh, layout resources structure, like it, for, it, it, it all starts with, you know, you have all your activities in activity package um, and fragments in fragment package, whatever. So ideally this shouldn't be the case when you look at your architecture, packaging structure, it shouldn't talk about Android. It's, 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 if it is too involved with Android, um, it is bad. It's, it's too coupled with the platform. It's really impossible. Like yesterday, I think it was a good example at the panel, uh, you're talking about Android cars. Suddenly, even though it is Android, same platform, you cannot use it with the car when it's not super easy to just publish your application because it's talk about too much. Um, uh, it, it screams basically a lot about your pl platform when even when you look at the architecture. Basically, what you need to do is just, just your your architecture. Your your architecture. Uh, should be platform agnostic, right? And then on top uh, on top of that, uh, you you will apply uh, your Android platform, or then you can apply uh, the same architecture into different platforms. Yeah. Yeah. Basically. Good. Enough of this. Let's jump into the more interesting topic: Kotlin multi-platform. Um, so we will show some simplified code. In the slides, really simplified to just focus on what we think is important. And to give you a little introduction into the um, tool itself, so Kotlin multi-platform is something that enables you to deploy Kotlin code onto to multiple platforms. It um, uses under the hood um, Kotlin JS to be able to deploy it um, to JavaScript, to like where we don't have a virtual machine. It uses Kotlin native um, to, wow, to deploy it to um, the native platforms like iOS, for example, or any other embedded system. And it's all backed by Gradle, thankful, thankfully, and that um, helps a lot to integrate it also into our existing projects. So um, this is, as, as we spoke about, um, Kotlin multi-platform 
encourages you to share your business logic. And to do so, you need a common, um, a common module. And to do so, you need to apply a Kotlin platform common plugin. And with this plugin, you can basically have a Gradle module. And with this Gradle module, you can share your business logic. You put it in. And obviously, you can just have dependencies to pure Kotlin code, right? So you cannot use RxJava, you cannot use your retrofit, you cannot use Mojito. You can actually, when you start doing this, you find out that you can't use a lot. And this is also one of the downsides so far. Um, yeah. yeah when, when applicable, they are putting more uh, and more into the common part. But basically, yeah, you cannot ac ac access any JDK methods, any Android methods. You, it's not like uh, when you integrate Kotlin into an Android project, it's much, yeah, limited. So this example, um, there's a common JVM module. So what does it mean? Um, it is a platform module which contains the JVM bindings that are expected by your common module. And in this scenario, we have two common modules. Uh, we have data and I.O. And within this Gradle module, we're going to um, supply the, um, the platform bindings, so the implementations that will work on the JVM for your project or for your code. And in here, we can now use all the JVM dependencies to fulfill this contract. And um, one of the latest features that had been added to Kotlin Multiplatform was the ability to actually have two expected by um, dependencies. So previously, there was just one allowed. And with two, now this means obviously that the, um, the door to the to multi, to multi-model approaches or multi-model architectures and structures are now is open and um, ready to be used. Um. Yeah, so here we, we see an example of a uh, desktop client. So we had, like when we are working on this project, we had no idea, uh, but it was really nice to see somebody uh, open a pull request after our blog post. Uh, by the way, we will share the sample project. Uh, yeah, that's, th this code is from there, but it, it's a desk desktop client. It was really uh, easy to review. It was really a simple pull request. Uh, but here you can see its application is, means the apply plugin application is the desktop application. Uh, but just use, uh, before this slide, we, we showed the common JVM. Here, since uh, this is just one option, so here in the desktop client, we use the common JVM. Uh, on Android as well, we will use the common JVM. Uh, yeah, and then, and then uh, otherwise we have like um, other dependencies we would need in a des desktop client. Yeah, that's it. So um, let's say you don't have a, a new project, for example, you don't need a common JVM module because you just have an Android client and you can skip that part. And this was also included of the last release of um, Kotlin. You can just have a Kotlin um, Android platform. Right, so you, from there you can directly um, declare your expected um, common module dependencies. So you can actually skip the common JVM module if you don't need that. Yeah, so it's getting more flexible and flexible uh, with, with the recent versions. So this is the, the, the screenshots from the official documentation. It's really good like and simple examples and here we have like uh, on top of the uh, Kotlin language, if you're familiar with it, like we only have expect and actual uh, keywords. They are like language constructs, but at the same time, they are they are enabled when you apply the appropriate plugins. So expect is in the common. Uh, it's like a partial class, I think. Uh, then you don't have an implementation there, but you expect that implementation to be somewhere else in your like. Uh, in an iOS project or like native, code native project or, or in a Java project. And on the other hand, you have the, uh, in the implementation side, uh, the actual keyword. So, and then you can go ahead and then have some actual fun there. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, things to notice here, uh, like if you um, think about traditional Java interfaces, essentially when you have an interface or an abstract class, the implementation needs to have a different name. 
So here you see the same names, Fu and Fu. That really make things much, much easier. So you don't have to invent names for your different, different platforms. It's, if it is Fu, it's also Fu in iOS. Um, that's, that, make, that makes it really easy. And if you look at the first one again, um, we have the constructor there. You know, uh, it's, it's, it's not an implemented class, but it still has constructor, which is going to be in, the actual constructor will be in the implementation. But what this gives us is that even in the common module, you can instantiate this, this common. Like, common has no idea about the implementation of this, but still can instantiate as long as it can provide a string. Uh, and the other nice thing is that the, the project, uh, the plugins and the compilation forces you to have implementation. So one of the problems with React Native was that, you know, the bindings and between Android and iOS people are falling behind, etc. Right here, you are forced to implement. Uh, as long as you change the expect clause, uh, you have to have the implementation in both platforms. Um, which is which uh, makes lots of things easier. It also means that you don't have to like on your platform module have to construct your whole application because usually you have to do this right because yeah. you just in your common part you just have access to the abstractions and then in the specific use cases you need to build it all together. Here it's different. You can basically in your common code construct the objects that you expect by the platform modules. And then on the platform, you can basically just use these dependencies and mm -hmm. yeah, use them as you want. In fact, maybe, yeah, we will talk about that later. So let's talk a bit about the um, example that we did. So um, we chose the Game of Life to implement an um, example for a Kotlin multi platform project. Um, why that? The game of life is a um, simulation for a cell reproduction. It's used in a lot of coding cartas for a lot of coding exercises. There are simple rules, so we thought it might be a good example. Also, we, to be honest, we just had limited time to, um, to deal with that, so we, um, yeah, we spiked that. And what we did is um, we implemented a React frontend. We implemented an Android client. And yeah, let's have a look at the code. So this is the only expect class we have uh, in the in the common module. So when you think about like um, multi-platform uh, threading is is one of the difficult things. Uh, it's it's a game. We are developing a game, and it has a game loop. You know, every, every interval. It has an iteration to redraw the board, basically. Uh, this is an asynchronous behavior, so we kind of had this simple uh, abstraction over that. So it's just a class without even a custom constructor. Uh, so you start with, and you give the interval, and then you get the callback uh, uh, in on tick, on tick function. And then you do your your thing there, and then you can stop and check if it is looping. So, and the implementations, we, we will see the implementations. In the JVM implementation, we use direct Java. You know, it, uh, it was the most familiar thing we had at the moment. So just flowable.interval. Uh, and then, as you can see, we have an additional private variable. Uh, it's game loop, and then, like, stopping is just disposing the game loop, and then, uh, is looping is just a null check over it. It's just a uh, sample implementation. Right. And in JavaScript, you know, we, we don't have much JavaScript knowledge at all, but it looks similar, right? We, we again have the game loop, game, game loop variable, and then we looked at it, and then nice thing is that with, with Kotlin, uh, when you have, when you're in the actual implementation, you can use the platform classes, it has really like Kotlin's focus is, is the interoperability, right? So just like it's really good with Java, it's much better with Java, but it's also really good with other, other platforms. So we are using, we found this window object there, and then it has this set, set interval. This is a window object from the browser package. So just an interval again, and then the rest is very similar. 
And yeah, this is the Kotlin, Kotlin native implementation for the Android, uh, for the <laughs> iOS client. And um, that looks similar to the other ones, right? Here we have the game loop, we instantiate it, and um, what we use here is NS timer and NS date. Now for a couple of you, this might look familiar. This is, um, these are basically um, classes that come from the um, iOS SDK. And now the question is, well, how, that, how, that, how does it work? Because this is still Kotlin code, and now we are calling basically um, iOS dependency, dependencies. And again, this is possible through the interoperability feature that um, Kotlin native has. And um, the Kotlin native compiler is actually shipped with um, bindings for almost the whole iOS SDK. That, that's really interesting. And um, in the end, this also means nowadays you could write your iOS applications just in Kotlin, which is crazy. That sounds great. And let's have a look at the Gradle plugin for Kotlin Native, since this is a bit uh, more interesting. So this has a slightly different plugin. It's called Conan, Kotlin Native. And here we need to specify our targets. And in this example, we targeted the iPhone and the iPhone simulator. And we had to specify some artifacts. Um, the framework closure defines the framework that will be produced by the compiler, um, and this is an Xcode framework, and we can then later on um, include it into an existing iOS project, for example. And this is also interesting to mention that here there's basically a hard bridge between Gradle and iOS, since um, the iOS IDEs, app code, Xcode, they don't know Gradle, they don't know how to work with Gradle. There's also basically the hard line, so you need to manually or through any other mechanism um, import then the um, the framework dependency. And framework on, is a li like a library, library in, library in iOS development. development. Exactly. And on other side, um, when you go have a look down on the dependencies, you still reference your common module as you would do it for the um, for the other platform modules. And speaking about um, writing iOS applications in Kotlin, App Code, which is the JetBrains IDE, um, meanwhile has also a plugin that allows you to create a single view app with Kotlin native framework, and yeah, you can basically have your view controller written in Kotlin. You uh, can do it, yeah. but the question is, should you do it? And when we now look back to one of the first slides we showed, Kotlin multi-platform, Kotlin native, these are tools to share business logic. Now we are here on the view controller level, now we are back on the platform. And yeah, the root of some should be um, leave the platform concerns to the platform experts and focus rather, at least from our perspective, focus on sharing the business rules. So we are going towards end. Uh, let's talk about what did we share at the end. You know, we only talked, we only showed you about the expected class and the actual implementations, but there is a whole a lot of like the, the usage of these. Basically, we have the models and the presenter and the views. Right. It starts with the entities. So. Uh, if you if you remember uh, remember the game, we have the board, and then uh, we have the state. We have the cells, like cells, and then cells are either alive or dead. So this is the entities, like completely in Kotlin, because it's like uh, really data objects. So then on top of that, this did we have the model. Uh, it's uh, like most of our business logic leave, leaves there, which is like transforming the board into the next stage. This is also like completely in Kotlin, where we don't really depend on any special uh, JDK uh, APIs or whatever, because like also I have to admit that uh, uh, although it's an asynchronous application, which was really good to work with, to see uh, some somewhat more close to real life applications, but at the same time, it's relatively simple. But it was really nice to see uh, that we can encapsul encapsulate the whole uh, business logic uh, of the models inside the common module. And then here, like the good thing is that uh, we can instantiate uh, the game loop inside here. 
right? And then, and then we have the presentation level. We were like hesitant whether what we should do, but like, you know, the UIs were like, even though not 100% uh, uh, the same, actually like web UI has the selection in the same page, but the Android and iOS has dialogues, uh, et cetera, but like still, this is the implementation detail of the view. So presentation logic was even the same. So we kind of abstracted the life cycle uh, aspects of the things like Android, iOS, and React. So it was not really hard. So we were able to do that. And then after doing that, we were able to even share the presentation layer. And then of course we have tests for these. And then the nice thing about the test is that you run the test once, and then it runs three times, like in our case, three times, but whatever client you have, it runs as many as that. So the only thing left is the views, which we call passive views. They don't really have logic at all. They just get the, uh, get the state, and then their job is to display it. And then it, you could even like, have really few number of code there with data binding and like I told you about this pull request where the guy was uh, adding, the pull uh, adding the desktop client, there, there he had only one if statement, uh, which was great to see and it was, even though we had no idea, it was really easy to review, it was really straightforward and then yeah, we, we basically merged it really quickly. Yeah, so one rule of thumb could be, or this is something that's really experienced, is um, you can basically share everything where you write unit tests for. All this can be shared. So yeah, what's missing? So last time we talked, it was like really uh, not much libraries out there when we were working with this project as well. So there are like lots of uh, projects coming up. Uh, so. Kevin uh, here at DroidCon as well is talking about Kotlin multi-platform in the enterprise uh, slot. Um, he recently worked on SQLite abstraction for Kotlin multi-platform, which is like amazing. Uh, there's Raygant, Jake Burton is working on that. You are not supposed to use it, but, but it's, it's, a, it's a reactive streams abstraction for multi-platform projects. Uh, just experimenting, and yeah, there are a couple of libraries, and uh, yeah, core things are interesting. Jake, like JetBrains, is, is working on many things at the same time, so they are they are uh, bringing core things eventually to iOS and native platform as well. But yeah, very slowly at the moment. Exactly, and we need these tools because threading, memory management, it, it's it's different on native platforms. We cannot rely on um, things that we are used to from the JVM. So we need these, these tools. So yeah, what's missing from our point of view, we need a better multi-threading support. In our example, we did multi-threading on the um, platform. Ideally, we would have multi-threading logic in the common module. You could obviously do this by abstracting it all away, but it would be good to have, as Tassin mentioned, something like coroutines being available so we could use, just fall back to this one. We are also a heavily user of um, reactive approaches and reactive patterns and use RxJava for that. So something like that would be also great. Um, caching, there's um, just before DreadCon Berlin, there has been uh, this SQL light library announced um, that works on Kotlin native and Kotlin multi-platform. Some better testing support. There's no mocking framework, so Mokito doesn't work. And yeah, some, of, some better SDK integration. So here are our references. Um, the code, we just showed some of it. Um, so open source, so you can have a look at. Um, the, we have some the link is long. Link is you long, don't have to yeah. memorize it, but we will share the slides, I think, <laughs> and you can click on it. Yeah, and that's it. Thanks. Okay.